red hats. A U.S. bishop is among 21 new cardinals named by Pope Francis. We have a report from Rome. Fetal tissue. Two pro-life lawmakers seek an investigation into a university accused of conducting research with the organs of preborn babies. Cost of living. The president talks inflation with the Fed chair. And global tensions. Assessing the administration's current posture on both the war in Ukraine and security concerns in the Pacific. We have analysis. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, May 31st, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I'm Tracy Sable. Now, the Catholic Church will soon welcome 21 new cardinals. Pope Francis made that announcement on Sunday. Terro un consistorio per la creazione di nuovi cardinali. At the end of the Sunday prayer, the Holy Father said on Saturday, August 27th, he will hold a consistory for the creation of new cardinals. One of the newly named cardinals is Bishop Robert McElroy of San Diego. Joining us now from Rome is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, great to see you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about these newly named cardinals? Yeah, thank you, Tracy. The creation of the new Cardinals has been long expected, but has yet been a real surprise as well, especially because there will be so many new Cardinals, 21 in total. 16 are below the age limit of 80 and could participate in a future election for the next Pope. I would like to point out three things related to these nominations. First, they are very international. Second, they contain key allies of Pope Francis inside and outside the Curia. And thirdly, these nominations will probably help guarantee a continuation of the vision that Pope Francis has laid out for the Church during his tenure. It has been close to Pope Francis's heart to show the Church as a Church of the peripheries to allow a voice to those far away from power. Many new cardinals are coming from places far away from Rome, Ghana, Nigeria, Singapore, Mongolia. Another remarkable fact about this announcement, there are quite a few new ones from dioceses that are atypical for being the seat of a cardinal, such as Marseille in France or Como in Italy. That came at the expense of traditional cardinal posts, such as in Milan. But there are also several key people for the current pontificate, as Archbishop Arthur Roach, prefect for the Congregation of Divine Liturgy, Lazaro Yu Hong Sik, heading the Congregation for the Clergy, and Fernando Verges, president of the Governate of Vatican City. And Andreas, what more can you tell us about the makeup of the College of Cardinals and also the only American named in this round? Well, Tracy, the consistory will take place on August the 27th. The College of Cardinals will have then 229 members, with 132 under the age of 80, thus eligible to vote in a future conclave. Among those newly created cardinals is Bishop Robert McElroy of San Diego. McElroy has strongly asserted his views that the Eucharist ought not to be denied to politicians who support the legalization of abortion. This is remarkable considering the current debate in the U.S. about the right to life. Overall, Pope Francis has created 122 cardinals. That large group will likely mean a continuous emphasis on, yes, evangelization and the right to life, but also on an increased awareness for the peripheries of church and society. They will likely continue Pope Francis's vision for the church. And Andreas, before I let you go, uh, I understand the Holy Father prayed a rosary with a special intention today. Um, what more can you tell us about that? Uh, that's right, Tracy. So at Santa Maria Maggiore Basilica today, the Holy Father prayed the rosary for peace in Ukraine and around the world. This, of course, is taking place at the end of the Marian month of May. Today's rosary took place in union with Marian shrines, shrines around the world, including the shrine of the Mother of God in Tsarvanetsia, western Ukraine. They were connected via video link to live broadcast from here in Rome. Well, Andreas, thank you so much for your time today. Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief, thank you again. Thank you, Tracy.
A Pope Francis is mourning the death of another cardinal. The Holy Father attended today's funeral mass for former Vatican Secretary of State Angelo Sodano. He passed away Friday at the age of 94 after a long illness. A recent investigation into the fetal tissue research program at the University of Pittsburgh found it followed all state and federal laws. But pro-life lawmakers contest the findings and tell EWTN News Nightly paying someone to investigate yourself is not viable. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has that story. The University of Pittsburgh hired a Washington, D.C. law firm to investigate and review its NIH-subsidized fetal tissue research program and found nothing wrong. But Senator James Langford and also Congressman Chris Smith and more than 80 other lawmakers say the report is flawed and are now asking the inspector general to investigate. No one gets to investigate themselves, okay? You, you don't get to be able to do that. We need to have an outside investigation as well because we need to know if they're using fetal tissue and adjusting the way abortions are actually occurring in clear violation of federal law. Lawmakers say before the investigation, multiple physicians claimed that there was a possibility that organs were being extracted from live babies, a violation of federal law. What is happening at the University of Pittsburgh, we believe, uh, is that they're enabling the death of an unborn child, violating federal law by using a procedure that's most likely to get the desired fetal tissue. In their letter, lawmakers state they're concerned. University researchers had, quote, illegally altered abortion procedures solely for the purpose of obtaining fetal tissue. Congressman Smith also tells me there is a possibility that some of the children were killed after birth. This is barbaric and we want to know did they break the law? And what will the Biden administration do to enforce the law? Last month, the watchdog organization Judicial Watch obtained new documents showing University of Pittsburgh officials had reached out to the National Institutes of Health requesting help to combat, quote, efforts to undermine important science using fetal tissue. Lawmakers say if university officials did break the law, they want charges to be filed and face prosecution. It's important to note that I reached out to the University of Pittsburgh and the D.C. law firm, which conducted the investigation. I have not heard a response. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, the topic of inflation was center stage at the White House today. Chair Powell and other leaders of the Fed have noted at this moment they have a laser focus on addressing inflation, just like I am. And with a larger complement of board members now confirmed, I know we'll use those tools and monetary policy to address the rising uh, prices for the American people. Now, President Joe Biden did not delve into any policy specifics other than to affirm his belief in the independence of the Federal Reserve. The president met with Fed Chair Jerome Powell along with Treasury Secretary and former Fed Chair Janet Yellen. The European Union has announced a ban on a majority of Russian oil. EU countries rely on Moscow for 25 percent of their oil. However, the leaders agreed to cut around 90 percent of Russian oil imports over the next six months to demonstrate their opposition to the invasion of Ukraine. An effort by China to sign a security and economic pact with 10 Pacific islands just failed, but it isn't giving up. China's foreign minister visited Tonga today on a regional island hopping tour. His mission is raising concern about Beijing's efforts to bring South Pacific islands under China's military influence. China just signed a security pact with the Solomon Islands last month. Well, in an effort to meet a June 1st deadline, Shanghai authorities are continuing to reopen China's largest city after a two-month COVID-19 lockdown. Stores, banks, and public transportation are restoring services. Movie theaters and gyms, however, remain closed. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern offered her condolences to President Joe Biden for the recent mass shootings in America. The two leaders met in the Oval Office today to discuss everything from trade to the war in Ukraine. As you've seen, we've got a lot to discuss. We have a lot to do, and I want to emphasize the last point you made, working together. We are not coming to dictate or lay down the law. Well, the White House says New Zealand and the United States are also working together to expand their partnership in space 
and promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. And joining us now to discuss this and more is John Elliott, Republican strategist and former National Security Council spokesman under President Donald Trump. John, welcome back. Always so great to see you. Great to be with you, Tracy. Thank you. So a lot to talk about, but I want to start off with the EU cutting almost 90 percent of Russian oil imports. Um, how significant is that? Well, that's going to be by the end of the year, uh, because right now they're shutting down the actual shipping uh, in the next month, and that'll go, and that's about a third. And then w when when you get more that comes online when they actually, from Germany and Poland, cut off the actual pipelines as well, that's when you're going to get to 90 percent. But it is significant, because that is the source of Putin's power is, and his money is, all comes through oil. This is, it's basically a one product economy. And so once they shut that down by 90 percent, take them offline, it's going to be very tough for him, in addition to the other sanctions that he's facing in the international community. So this will put maximum pressure on him at the right time where we're trying to pressure him to get realistic and come to the table and end and, and what he's doing in Ukraine. Yeah, and, and let's talk about that a little bit more, about what's happening uh, in Ukraine. I know Russia is continuing its attacks in the Donbas region. Uh, what more can you tell us about that, John? Well, Putin is trying to build a land bridge and have them actually be part of Russia that would go from the, from Russia inland all the way down to Crimea that they already have as part of their territory right now. So what he's doing, the problem is, is that he's unable to do that because he's fa he's now we're into the third we're past three months we're into the fourth month of, of the war and what happens is he thought it was going to be over in 72 hours and he'd be able to take Kiev and then essentially just do this. He's now having to essentially destroy a bunch of towns, bunch of cities really uh, along that region to create that land bridge and so he's facing a lot bigger resistance and there's no end in sight unfortunately because the Ukraine they're never going to accept giving away their territory and Putin. It's going to be a real climb down, a real embarrassment for him if he doesn't get that goal. So they're really at a loggerheads right now and there's no end in sight. So yeah. I was going to ask you, I mean, how long do you think this is going to last? I guess it's really hard to tell. What's the end game here for Russia? Well, the end game for Russia is once going to get that land bridge. But the problem is, is that they're not down to Crimea. But the problem is, is that they're, the Ukrainians are fighting a lot harder. So the end game here for Russia is either they get, they pressure, they change the ground game right now, the results on the ground to make Ukraine come to the table and accept that, that's very unlikely to happen. So it's just going to go on for months until maybe he feels the pain through this 90 percent energy embargo, essentially, or energy uh, export uh, embargo that is going to be imposed on him, and then he'll come to the table possibly at that point. Yeah. I want to switch gears here. I sure. um, want to talk about Taiwan. And they say about 30 Chinese warplanes entered its air defense zone. What does that signal, and how concerned should we be about this? Well, it signals that they were really, this is once again an outgrowth of Biden's trip to Asia, where he had said that we were going to, it seemed like he was announcing a new policy of the U.S. that we were absolutely going to defend militarily ta Taiwan. We have never gone that far, not since we had the, uh, not since the late 70s. And so that seemed like a change in policy. The White House walked back his comments, as they so often do, which we understand from a report on NBC that that's really annoying Biden, that he is being, that, that he's being undermined by his own staff in some ways. But anyway, back to Taiwan is that uh, what happened is we had some lawmakers that visited there in Taiwan, which is a good sign. That was led by Tammy Duckworth, a, a Democrat. And so it was good that she brought a delegation over there because we're Taiwan's only big brother or buddy that they have in the world who's theoretically going to defend them. And so the more that we can through our lawmakers and through visits like Alex Azar did under Trump in the last year and others uh, have high level delegations going over there, it really shows China that we're serious and that we're not just going to abandon Taiwan, even though the White House sometimes suggests that after a strong Biden statement. Yeah. So much more we can talk about. Unfortunately, we're out of time. John, always great to see you. Thanks for coming. Great on. to be here, Tracy. Thank you. Coming up vandalism against sacred spaces. An irreplaceable gold tabernacle is stolen from a Catholic church in Brooklyn. President Joe Biden works to control soaring inflation. Americans are not feeling confident 
about the direction of the economy. The new Gallup poll shows 77 percent of Americans think the nation's economic outlook is getting worse, while only 20 percent say the economy is getting better. And joining us now to talk about that and more is Chris Bedford, senior editor at The Federalist and co-founder of Right Forge. Chris, great to have you on. Thanks so much. Um, let's talk about those numbers now. President Joe Biden has said inflation is his top economic priority. Do you think that he'll be able to rein in the inflation that we've been battling and regain Americans' confidence? Well, certainly not with the path that they've been pursuing. Right now, it's really disheartening to see the president pushing out a plan in the newspaper article for how he's going to tackle inflation. But one of the, one of the, one of the top steps is to do nothing, to not simply not interfere with the Fed. Now, he is in a tough spot. We have been spending way too much in this country for administration of both parties after administration of both parties for years. But he compounded this at a time uh, as soon as he came into office, infusing even more money into an already weakened economy. Now, the Federal Reserve is going to be faced with a dangerous position here. Do they raise interest rates in order to beat inflation? Do we actually cure the sickness that's uh, impacting America's fiscal health? Or do they just try to push it off and push it off and push it off to, for political gain? It's almost certainly that they're just going to keep on pushing it off. But whether you're an investor or whether you're just a consumer or whether you're just a mother trying to pick up fruit snacks at the grocery store, you can tell that right now that something is very sick in our economy, and there's no hiding that with any political messaging. Yeah. Uh, on a different note, uh, Chris, as you know, there were more deadly shootings over the Memorial Day weekend uh, coming on the heels of that tragic Uvalde shooting that really shook the nation. Um, what do you think needs to be done? I know it seems our neighbors to the north in Canada uh, are floating an idea that would freeze the purchase and sale of firearms. Um, what more do you know about that? Well, the Canadian government is doing that. They're, they're, Justin Trudeau's government is pushing forward some legislation to try and make it so they can buy back ARs and seize the sale of other guns, We're trying to say this is just about hunting. Now, Trudeau's got a problem here, though. He's got a minority government. He has to work with different parties. Uh, he's not completely in charge. And as we've seen in Canada over the last few months, uh, he's got no regard for freedom. He'll seize your bank account. He'll hit you wherever he likes. Uh, and that's a dangerous place for the Canadian people to be in. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another thing I want to touch on is... Um, Something that happened this afternoon, a jury found Michael Sussman not guilty of lying to the FBI uh, in 2016 when he was working for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Let's talk a little bit more about this. I mean, this is a story that didn't get a whole lot of play recently. It's unfortunate to see that this was a, an innocent verdict, but it's not unexpected at all. It's extremely rare in Washington, D.C., for people to actually be convicted beyond just the investigation, actually convicted of lying to the FBI. And as some commentators have pointed out, there are a number of Hillary Clinton donors who are part of this jury. It didn't, it, it was, there was no reason to be particularly optimistic from the beginning, just like it has, there's not been a lot of reason to be very optimistic that anyone would ever be held accountable for these, these, these actions that were taken against the last president and by the FBI and by outside investigators as well. However, that doesn't mean it's not an actual victory in some way for truth and for the prosecution here. A lot has been revealed. A lot of works with outside attorneys like Sussman working at the FBI to fine-tune their public their public relations releases, to actually work into the Democratic campaign, and the amount of FBI agents in particular who are willing to roll over on Sussman and blame him for all sorts of things, I think uh, bodes well for the, for the investigation going forward. Uh, another thing, as you know, uh, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi has been recently barred uh, from receiving the Holy Eucharist by Archbishop Cordelion and now by other bishops uh, because of her outspoken support of abortions. I want to get your thoughts on that, Chris, and I know that you recently wrote an article uh, about that. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, right now we're, we're reaching a place where politicians and bishops alike have been able to kick the football or at least ignore the abortion question. Everyone just wants to say it's the law of the land. But now legislators, now that it's under threat that the Supreme Court is, is kicking this decision back to the legislators, politicians actually have to make a stand, which means the church also has to make a stand. I think Archbishop Coeur d'Alene has been extremely brave and courageous and also very careful going about this the way that they came up with the strategy with the U.S. Con uh, Conference of Bishops and also taking into account the Vatican's warning to take things slowly, to reach out and to, and to, and to try to have meetings and to try to correct somebody like Nancy Pelosi or other leaders who are pushing this. This is not excommunication. This is just the archbishop saying, you need to correct your path. It's, a, it's hopefully corrective behavior and trying to bring somebody back toward what God's law is. 
Hopefully she listens, and either way, I do think the church needs to stand up, because over the last 60 or 70 years of apolitical silence, we've ended up with the United States that doesn't understand a lot of the church's teachings and politicians that are actively antagonistic to it. The Catholic Church ought to speak up on these issues. Okay, we're going to leave it right there. Chris, always great to get your insights. Thanks so much. Thank you. Up next, special novena. See how a South American nation celebrates the Holy Spirit. Yet another Catholic church has suffered desecration and vandalism. An irreplaceable gold tabernacle worth around $2 million was stolen from St. Augustine Catholic Church in Brooklyn, New York. The angel statues next to the tabernacle were decapitated and destroyed, and the consecrated hosts were thrown onto the altar. The burglars had cut through the tabernacle's protective casing. They also removed portions of the church's video security system. And joining us now to talk more about this is Katie Yoder, DC correspondent for Catholic News Agency. Katie, great to see you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Let's talk a little bit more about this. I mean, it's so hard to believe that somebody would do something like this. Uh, we mentioned the monetary value, but honestly, you know, you really can't put a price on a, a sacred object like this. Right, that's right. The Brooklyn Diocese is saying that this tabernacle is irreplaceable. It's estimated to be worth two million. It's made out of gold. Um, but, you know, another thing we should note, as you said, um, the Holy Eucharist that was inside that tabernacle, that was thrown across the altar. Uh, and so the body of Christ, that's something that we as Catholics absolutely cannot put a price on. Yeah, it's really hard. It's so unimaginable. Do we, you know, have any idea, the police have any leads to whom this may be or maybe more than one person? Sure. Well, the police are still investigating this and they're asking that anyone with information come to them, the New York Police Department. Uh, and they haven't specified whether it's a group or an individual, but hopefully we'll find out more about it soon. Yeah, and, and it seems like it these type of heinous crimes are, you know, happening more and more. I know this is something that the USCCB has been investigating for some time. That's right. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, U.S. Bishops, have been noticing a growing trend in the past couple years even. And they've been documenting this, and they say since May 2020, there have been 134 incidents of arson, vandalism, and other destruction at Catholic churches. And that doesn't even include this latest example at uh, the Brooklyn Parish. Uh, so it's, it's really growing, these incidents, uh, and it's really escalated just this month after the Supreme Court leak of a draft opinion that says that justices may overturn Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion nationwide in 1973. Uh, and the Catholic Church teaches that abortion is a grave evil and it destroys a human person of inherent dignity and worth. And so a lot of abortion groups and supporters have criticized the Catholic Church for that. Uh, we are running out of time, but with about 30 seconds left or so, Katie, but I'm curious, how do you see this playing out? I mean, do you think these awful attacks will continue um, as we get closer to when this opinion will be um, released? I would say if this month is any indication, I would not be surprised if they do continue, but we will be keeping our eyes open uh, and monitoring it as time goes by. I know you will. We'll continue to pray about it. Katie, yes. thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. Great to have you. And finally tonight, on a more festive note, a unique religious procession in Brazil is celebrating the traditional nine days between Ascension Thursday and Pentecost Sunday. It is known as the Folia of the Divine Holy Spirit, a tradition dating back two centuries. Nearly 300 people travel both on horseback and on foot. They bear red and white flags with a symbolic image of a white dove. The procession evangelizes the farms and villages in the countryside of Brazil's Goya's state. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.